Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Steve Fisher, and today we have a special event going on, our baptism services. But we know not everyone was able to make it out here, so we wanted to give you a special message that you can watch today so that you can receive from God and His Word. So we went to our archives and found one of our best messages on baptisms, and you can watch that here. So lean in and enjoy this special message. If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, you have to start on page one of the Bible, where the uncreated world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place. But then above the chaos, God's Spirit is there, hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but what is God's Spirit? Yeah, so the Spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach. Yeah, you got to clear your throat at the end. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy? How so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. <sighs> so you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply, that too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, Ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's Ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's Spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And then it happens to this guy named Bezalel, and he's an artist. God's Spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophets saw it. While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes. And the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's Spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. This story is saying that God's Spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's Spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's Spirit. And so today, the Spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the Spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity, living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving Spirit. Kind of in the last message here in our series called The Path to God. Is it religion? Is it relationship? How do we truly know God? Like we were just singing, I, I love that song because it's talking about the, the beauty of knowing him. And not just about him, not just as some distant figure, but actually communing with God and him being alive in our hearts. And you can just feel his presence in this room right now and even as we we worshiped his spirit just came and, and it's in his presence was where there's freedom where there's joy where there's answers and that's why it's so important that we truly get to know god because 
you know, just in, if you think about relationships that you have, they kind of go through three phases. You first have the acquaintance phase where you just are introduced to somebody. And Jesus talks about this. He says in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. So maybe this is your first time to church today. Maybe you, you don't even really know anything about God or who he is or, or what this, is, this church deal is all about. Well, you can know this. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart knocking, saying, I want to get to know you. I want to introduce myself to you. And once we move on from that acquaintance, we kind of enter the friend zone. You know, just picture people that you know. You become friends with them. And it, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, but I have called you friends. So this is showing a progression to our relationship with God. And you may have moved into this friend zone with God. You, you like God, but you don't always time, have time just to hang out with God or, or, or worship or praise or go to church. Uh, but, but there's more. There's another step. When you truly get to know somebody, you move into family. Even people that aren't blood-related, people you just connect with so much, you, you start to call them family. And Jesus says, uh, or it says in the Bible that God disciplines us. He says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. And so this may be some of you where you've given your heart to Jesus and are getting closer to him and to the point where God loves you so much as, your, as his own son and daughter, he's willing to even discipline us to help us get on the right path that will bring us the most success in our life. And so our goal today is to help each one of us take a, one more step closer in our relationship with God. And I just want to start this message off with this one, this bit of information, bit of revelation, and that's that God loves you so much. That is the greatest revelation I, I believe that you can ever receive is just a fraction of the understanding of how much God really loves you. It changes everything when that's revealed, not to your mind, but into your, into your heart. And that's the foundation of everything that we're talking about is this burning love that God has so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners so that we can call on his name and be saved. So we're going to start with a little story. And this story was from my life about 15 years ago in America. Um, we were living in Hong Kong at the time, but we would travel back to America about once a year. And so this one trip, I was, we were in Florida, and I was with my brother and my dad, and we wanted to go fishing. And there was a lake near where we were staying in Florida, lots of lakes there. And so a friend of ours let us use their boat. We got up early in the morning, took the boat to the dock, you know, put the boat into the water, and threw all our fishing gear and all that into the boat to go catch some bass. And bass tastes really good, and so we got up bright and early to do that. So we started to set off from the, the shore and got about, I don't know, like uh, 50 meters off from shore. And so far, everything's going great. <laughs> And I, I still remember this. My dad, he, he kind of looked back. He, he was driving the boat. He kind of looked back and then looked back at me and my brother. And he said, boys, where's the motor? <laughs> it was like, uh, what, the motor? So we, we looked back and the motor is gone. It literally fell off the boat while we were driving. We didn't even hear it happen. I don't know how, that, how we didn't even know. So we looked about five meters out and we could see bubbles bubbling up from the from the bottom of the lake. It's just like a cartoon or something when you, you picture that. And so we're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> this motor is gone. So my brother, he's a little more, more like fast and he just kind of does some stuff and then thinks later sometimes. He just jumped in with his fully clothed, everything just jumped in the water. And me using my meticulous mind, I, I, was, I took my shirt off first and then my shoes and socks. So I just jumped in with my shorts on because I knew you know that'd be a little bit better. So the thing is, the day before, we kind of checked this lake out, and we saw alligators swimming around this lake, which are very notorious in Florida. And so we just jumped into water. It's barely light outside. Can't hardly see anything. And there's alligators also swimming in this lake. 
and we're supposed to find a motor that just sank to the bottom. <laughs> so we, we start swimming to the bubbles, and I just remember just taking a big breath and just going straight down, just swimming out like this with my hands into black nothingness. I, eyes closed, I, I couldn't see anything, just going straight down, probably like three or four meters deep. And I, I still remember I was doing this, and then suddenly my hand hit a, a shaft, hit the rod of the engine motor in the bottom of the lake. And if you've ever looked for stuff in water, it's very, very difficult to find anything on the, surf, on the, the floor of any kind of ocean or, or lake. So that was quite a mirror. I, I hit it and I was like, oh my goodness, I, I got the motor. And so I swam back to the top and like lifted up like a trophy, like, yes, we got the motor. And somehow made it back to the boat and we hooked it up again and went on our way and had a great time fishing. <laughs> And so that was really like a miracle, I think, that we were able to even find it. But I wanted to share that story with you because it illustrates a point, a certain word that we're going to be talking about today, and that's the word baptism. So when I jumped in the water, I was, you could say, baptized or immersed into water. And so this word, baptized, is actually often misunderstood because people, when they hear that word, they tend to think immediately some kind of religious term, but actually Baptize simply means to immerse, and it's, a, it's really a common day, everyday word that represents a spiritual reality. And so baptize is from the Greek word baptizo, which means to immerse, submerge, or saturate, which when we jumped in the water, that instantly happened to us. And in Jesus' day, everybody knew what this meant. Everybody knew what baptize meant because it was common practice for them to take fabrics and, and baptize them into a dye, like a, you know, a colored dye, and pull them out, and they'd be a different color to make their beautiful you know, clothing or whatever. Baptizing it, it was, that was the word they used, and we're going to baptize this fabric. So everybody knew what that concept was behind that word. Something goes in one way and comes out a different way. So there are three different baptisms actually talked about in the, well, in the New Testament specifically relating to the life of a, a born-again believer. And actually there's a number of baptisms, baptisms in the Bible that are referred to, but there's three primary ones that directly connect to our relationship with God. And so that's what we're going to hit today. And I, this is kind of like a, a fundamentals message it's one of those messages that you need to, to understand, and I believe this is going to be very uh, eye-opening as we go through this. So each baptism has four different parts. We can put this up on the screen here. We've got, number one, the element. So what are, you what are you immersed into? And then number two is the baptizer. Who's actually doing the baptism? And number three, the candidate. Who is the person being baptized? And finally, number four, what's the purpose of the baptism in the first place. So these four components apply to all of them, and we're going to kind of fill in the blanks for these three important baptisms so you understand how they apply to you. So the first baptism is baptism into the body of Christ, which is salvation. We look at that right there. We see that, number one, the elements that we're baptized or immersed into is the body of Christ. The one who administers this baptism is the Holy Spirit which I think is pretty cool. And the candidate, who is this for? It's for the new believer, somebody who wants to commit their life to Jesus. And the purpose of this is to join the family of God. So you might think, well, it sounds a little strange to be baptized into Christ's body. Like, that doesn't really, really make sense. And we, we have to remember we're using natural words to describe a spiritual reality and something that helps me kind of picture this is if you just imagine a big lump of Play-Doh, you know, what kids play with, the gooey Play-Doh. Imagine you had a big ball of it, and then you had a smaller little piece. If you took that little piece and pressed it into the bigger piece, or you could say immersed it or baptized it into that bigger piece, suddenly the small piece has become part of the bigger piece. And that's what's happening when we are immersed into the body of Christ we are given a new identity. Our old identity is gone, and Jesus is saying, You're, you have a new identity in Christ. Because it says in, in 1 Corinthians 
chapter 12, verse 13, for we, so that's who, who's going to, who's qualified, it's, it's we, are all baptized by who? By one spirit, so as to form one body, and that's the body of Christ. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, that just means it's for everybody. There's nobody that God doesn't want to be a part of his family, and we're all given uh, one spirit to drink. So when you repented of your sins and confessed Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, the Holy Spirit, just like this verse says, baptized your spirit into Christ's body. And the, the Bible even describes this as being like you, you took part in the crucifixion with Jesus. You, were died, you died with him and were buried with him and rose together and raised to a new life. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Having been buried with him, in what? In baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised you from the dead. And so spiritually, we were buried, covered in sin and brokenness, and, but then we were raised back to life, covered in righteousness taking part of Jesus' work on the cross. And so this first baptism, it's a spiritual baptism administered by the Holy Spirit himself to anyone who calls on the name of the Lord to be saved. And if you've never experienced this baptism, you, we're going to give an opportunity for everyone to do that today at the end of our service just by simply repenting of our sin and asking Jesus to be the Lord of our life through a prayer. And this will give the Holy Spirit permission to do that work on the inside. And it's important that you remember that the Bible talks about people being three parts. Number one, we're, we've got a body that, that we live in. Number two, we have a mind or a soul that we function with. But number three, most importantly, we're a spirit. And on the inside is our spirit man. And the Bible even talks about it. It's like the real man. The real you is the spirit on the inside. And that is what is baptized into the body of Christ through the wonderful work of salvation. So next we have the baptism of water where your body is actually submerged in water, kind of like when I jumped into the lake. And this is one that I think most people are most familiar with. So we've got the element is obviously water. Who's the baptizer? It's man. And the candidate is the believer so this is after you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And the purpose of this is to bury the old life. So this baptism is an outward expression of what happened to you when you were baptized into the body of Christ, the first baptism we just talked about. Because water baptism is a symbol of the new birth. And this baptism done by man, done in water, it does not save you. And I think some people get confused about this. They think, well, I'm not really a born-again believer. I'm not really part of the family of God unless I've been baptized in water. Well, water doesn't save you. Man surely doesn't save you. We are only saved by the, the power of Jesus Christ and by grace through faith in his miracle-working sacrifice on the cross. That's what saves us. But this baptism of water is an action that every believer should take as a sign to themselves and to those around them that just, is just simply saying, my old life, it's gone, and my new life is here in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, and the old is gone. The new is here. And you don't have to wait to receive this water baptism after receiving Jesus into your heart. And that's a, a common one that we hear a lot of is people saying, well, I, you know, I'm just going to wait till I kind of feel ready or till I understand more about the Bible or till my family approves and all these different reasons. But when we look into the scripture, we see over and over again people being baptized immediately after they receive Jesus and so there's a story where Paul and Silas, they were preaching the gospel in a city, 
And they were, the religious leaders of that city did not like what they were doing, so they beat them, put them in prison, and they were shackled with chains on their, their ankles and feet. But in the middle of the night, they were praising and worshiping God, and God moved in and shook the building where they were, and it, the shackles came off, the prisoners were free. And the jailer, who was responsible for everyone in that place, saw what happened and thought everybody escaped. And so he was about to kill himself. And then Paul and Silas came over and said, no, no, we're, we're all still here. Don't kill yourself. And they started to preach the gospel to him at like midnight while they were still beaten and bruised, but they're ministering to this guy. And so we'll pick it up right there in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately, here we go right here, immediately he and all his household were baptized. So you can kind of see a progression in this verse. It starts out at the beginning saying, number one, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's the first baptism into the body of Christ. But then at the end of this section, it says, then immediately he and his family, they were all baptized in water. Another example from scripture is when Paul, he encountered Jesus on the road to a city named Damas Damascus. And he, he became a believer through this miraculous encounter. And a few days later, a prophet named Ananias came to see him because he, he was actually blind from this encounter from the light of Jesus and so the prophet prayed for him. His eyes were healed and opened. And then the prophet said this to Paul in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. He said, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, trusting him to save you. And so this prophet Ananias was kind of like, hey, what? You mean you're not baptized yet? Come on, this is, this is your next step. Let's go do it right now. And he was baptized. And then finally, one more example in the evangelist named Philip, this was all after Jesus had ascended into heaven, but Philip was led by the Spirit to a eunuch uh, from Ethiopia. And this eunuch had questions about God. He's in the Bible, he says he was riding in his chariot, and suddenly, like Philip, appeared right there miraculously. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 35, it says, Then Philip began with the very passage of Scripture that the eunuch was reading and told him the good news about Jesus. And then they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And then verse 37, then Philip said, What's the first criteria? If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. So we can see this so clearly, believe in the Lord Jesus and be baptized in water because this is an important step in your relationship with God and um, we, we, wanna make this, uh, op, we wanna make this available to everyone in the church as well. And so we are preparing right now for our next water baptism. We don't know the date yet. We were communicating with the school and the pool people down there, but for some reason this time they said we can't use the pool again for a baptism. So uh, we had it already on Friday and like got the news and like, oh man, we, that's not gonna work. So we're, we're right now we're actively looking on where we can do this. So if, if you've not yet been baptized in water, this is your next step. And you can, you can find out in the, in the information on the website or in the Next Steps Center back there. But I couldn't resist uh, also showing this video of this little cute boy who was getting baptized for the first time Go ahead and run that. This morning, uh, who have accepted Christ as his Savior and as his Lord, and he will demonstrate his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, by willingly being baptized this morning. He's been waiting on this day a long time. <laughs> and so, Jordan, upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Jordan. All right.
But so that's what baptism is like. Except normally the pastor dunks you down, but that that kid was so excited he could not wait, and he he did it himself. But yeah, that's that's awesome. So the third baptism, remember we talked about three of them. That's essential to growing your relationship with God is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We we'll go ahead and look at this. The element that we're baptized into or immersed into is the Holy Spirit. And this time, the baptizer, the one who's administrating this, is Jesus himself. And the candidate, again, is for the new believer. And the purpose is power to serve. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, this was John the Baptist speaking. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So, wow, who is, who's the he in this verse? Well, that he was Jesus. And it's saying Jesus will baptize us in the Holy Spirit. And so later, after Jesus finished his work on the cross, he was talking in Acts chapter 1, verses 4, and he said to his disciples, uh, well, uh, the introduction here, on one occasion while he was speaking to them, he gave them this command, and he said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, he was talking to his disciples. They were already Christians. They were already believers. If anybody on earth would have been a believer, it would have been them. They, they saw everything happen in Jesus' life. They were baptized with water. So they had the first two bath, baptisms, but Jesus was like, wait, there's more. It's not enough. I've got more power for you. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to grow in your relationship with God. And so in the next chapter, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, this is when it actually happened, just a few days after Jesus said this. So when the day of Pentecost came, they were together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And these verses describe the first time that believers were baptized or immersed into the Holy Spirit. And they received the supernatural power from God and I kind of think of it like this. When you get saved, which is, you know, confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's like taking a, a drink of a refreshing cold glass of water. And that water just comes in and fills you on the inside, and it gives you life, and it refreshes you. You can't live without this water on the inside. Jesus said, I have living water. That's when we drink that, and it fills us up on the inside. And baptism in the Holy Spirit is like this, where imagine being fully clothed and you jump into a pool. And when you get out of the pool, you're just soaked with water. It's just dripping off on you. People can see the water all over your body and your clothes. This is like being baptized into the Holy Spirit. God just gets all over you. You're just dripping with God. You've got God on the inside, and you've got God on the outside to begin to have power to serve him and do uh, literally work miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit by praying for people. And I mean, just picture this example going to work, and right before you jump in the elevator, you just dunk yourself in water. So you walk up, walk into work or walk into your, to your house, and you walk in and everybody just sees you. You're just going to look different. You're going to smell different. Everybody's going to notice. There's something different about this person. When you go over and you, when you bump somebody, a little bit of that water splashes onto them. When you go sit in your chair and get up, it's, it's wet in the area that you sat. You can't interact with anybody without a little bit of what's on you getting on them. 
And in the same way, God wants you to just get so immersed into the Holy Spirit that when you walk around, people are just, there's something different about that guy. There's something different about that lady. When they walk in the room, the atmosphere changes. It just seems like darkness has to leave because there's something, something special when they, when, they, when they touch me, I feel the presence of God. When they pray for me, there's power in the prayer. And this is the difference between somebody who's been immersed in the Spirit of God, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they walk around with that. And that's what Jesus, I can't get over how boldly Jesus said, hey guys, the disciples who were with him the whole time, he's like, just stay here. Just don't, please, don't go anywhere. Just waiting for the Holy Spirit to be immersed into, and then, then you can go into to all the world and be my disciples. And I mean, can't you just see that picture? Isn't that amazing what God can do? He thinks of everything. He thinks of taking care of us on the inside, but also giving us the power so we're not working in our own efforts. And so Jesus said this in Acts chapter one, verses eight, it says, when you receive the power from the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, into the ends of the earth. And so the purpose for this power from the Spirit is to serve God, to accomplish his will for our life. And it's not just to, it's not to make us something special. Baptism doesn't make us better than somebody else. It just makes me the best version of me. It'll make you the best version of you. And that's why God wants all, all believers to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, we could literally talk on this for hours about the different ways that the Spirit will help you and empower you in your life. We, we can't even cover it all in a short message like we have today. But one of the signs that we saw in the scripture we read in Acts chapter 2, one of the first signs of, of being filled with the Spirit was they were given an ability to pray in a heavenly language, in a new language they didn't understand and actually, they began to speak languages of other nations of the earth. God kind of proclaiming this miracle to everyone, people speaking languages they've never spoken or heard of before. And later in scripture, we see it taught how God gives us a, a heavenly language through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can pray out. And we don't, our mind doesn't understand it, just like the disciples' minds didn't understand it when they were speaking those words. But it's divine unction or utterance from God to pray out his perfect will for your life on this earth. Just imagine being able to tap into the riches of infinite knowledge of God and pray that out in your life. That's the power of praying in our heavenly language, or it's sometimes called praying in other tongues. And in Jude chapter 1 verse 20, it says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most, most holy faith and praying, not, not in the mind. We, we need to do that. We need to pray in our language, but also to pray in the Holy Spirit. And so you can receive this baptism today, too. We're going to do that, uh, have a prayer and prayer time and our prayer experience for that. We want to give everyone an opportunity to, to take part in all three of these baptisms these immersions into God. And so what, what you need to do kind of at the close of this message, what, what do we need to do? We need to examine our life and see which of these we haven't done yet and just simply take the next step and do it and see how powerful, see how amazing God is when we take a step of faith closer to him. So baptism or immersion into the body of Christ, that's the first step, which is salvation. Baptism of water, which is our outward declaration of something amazing that happened on the inside. And then baptism in the Holy Spirit, which God fills you with power. And right now we're going to give an invitation for that first one to, to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And there may be someone here today or there may be someone watching online who's never taken this step. Well, today is your day, and we can do it together. I, I just like everyone right now to bow your heads and to close your eyes, and we'll just create an atmosphere of reverence for God right now. And I'm going to pray a simple prayer, because in the Bible it says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that includes you. 
And so I'd, as I pray this prayer, please just repeat it after me. And I'd like to, to ask everybody here, just let's all pray this together so no one is praying alone. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and that I am lost. Right now, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I believe you died for me and that God raised you from the dead. Right now, I turn from my old life turn from my old life and I ask you to be my Lord and Savior thank you for saving me and making me a part of your family amen well amen we just want to welcome anyone who may have prayed that for the first time let's just put our hands together and just celebrate that there are those who have prayed to accept Jesus today and the Holy Spirit is doing his work on the inside. That's just so powerful. And so we're going to go into the next section of our service where we can just really respond to what God has spoken to us today through the word. So I just encourage you just to keep pressing into what's happening and just invite my wife Janice to lead us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Holy Spirit is God's power given to the church to live supernaturally and go beyond our natural understanding and as pastor naya just shared one of the first signs of being filled is you will begin to uh, you'll be given the ability to pray in the heavenly language so when you pray in your heavenly language you don't understand what is being said but god does you produce the sound but he who provides the words and articulation. And this is just an act of pure faith that um, he will step in, God will step in when you begin to speak. Um, I love to pray with our kids every day um, when we drive our kids to school. Always pray in the Spirit. Um, Gemma Thea, they they really like praying in the Spirit and they literally would not care what people think. Um, every time we would start off like, you know, worshiping, and then they would start praying um, with a really funny sound. They would, they would go on like, goose, 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 goose. I think it's just so funny every time when I think of it. Um, they, they don't care. They, they just want it so bad, and they, they knew as long as they opened their mouth, the Holy Spirit will just give, it, give them words. Um, so when you speak in English, your brain give you the words, but when you speak in tongues, your spirit will giving will give you the word. And a couple days a couple days ago, as I was driving after I dropped the kids off, I felt very very burdensome and and just there's such heaviness on in my spirit, and I could sense my spiritual battery is running low, because I feel so drained and I felt like there's so many areas that I need to pray for and I don't know where to start with and I just start praying in the spirit and the burden and the weariness inside of me were instantly lifted because I knew on the inside I just have that peace on the inside knowing what it needs to be prayed for what's pray on um, so today we're going to pray together we also want to give um, those who are not baptized with the Holy Spirit an opportunity to receive it this very very precious gift um, and after that, we're going to pray on the prayer point. The prayer point will be on the screen. Screen, And we really encourage you, those who know how to pray in the Spirit, open your mouth to support those um, that who has not received the gift yet. Let's all stand. Yes, God. Um, and the prayer will be on the screen. Let's all open our mouth to um, receive it. Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to all who believe in Him. I believe and I ask you, Jesus, to baptize me in the Holy Spirit right now. Yes. I believe you hear me when I pray, um, when I pray and are feeling me right now. I submit myself to the love and guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I will pray in the heavenly language He gives me. Thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful gift. Amen. And 
We can continue to pray. You guys can continue yes, praying in the spirit, God. and we're going to pray on the prayer part. Holy Spirit, Thank we also you. ask you to continue to fill us up daily. Yes. We need your presence in our lives, guiding, directing, comforting, and counseling us. Give us a fresh revelation from your word today and every day. Give us Thank a holy you, fear of the Lord. Help us to be in awe of who God is and what God does. Holy Spirit, work in us. Teach us and transform us. Help us to live aware, to choose wisely, to stay close to you and anchor in your truth. Empower us with your spiritual gift to strengthen the church and to help bring the reality of the kingdom of heaven on earth. That we will be light and love in the world that so desperately needs your hope. Draw many to know you as Savior and the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to worship the next couple moments. In the arms of the Father, there is love like no other. He who formed all things offers love to me.
just have your hands up and receive from Jesus. He's just pouring out his Holy Spirit. He's just pouring out more, just asking for more. God, God, I ask you for more in my life, more of you in my life. you enjoyed that message next week we'll be back at our regular location and hope to see you there in person and that'll be on june 2nd that we'll have our next service there so we'll see you then